right, well, uh, thanks for, for joining us on uh, sort of the end of the show here, two hours to go. Uh, I'm James Malakowski. I know some of you, but uh, don't know most of you. Uh, I work at Ericsson, and we're focused on building products around software-defined infrastructure. Uh, my background, I've spent uh, 10 plus years in the data center, uh, working with some of the world's largest companies, deployed data centers, and uh, started a company a few years ago to do that, and uh, wound up joining Ericsson as a result of an acquisition of that company. Uh, Actually, we were here a couple years ago at the Open Compute Summit uh, with a booth, uh, so it's kind of a fun to be back. Um, so uh, today we're going to talk about uh, software agents and hyperscale data center systems. Um, what does that mean? Well, really, the topic here is about collecting data at scale uh, in a data center, and more importantly, some of the implications of dealing with that uh, when you're thinking about things like Open Compute, commodity infrastructure, and just large swaths and swarms of hardware and software that, that scale out to support your applications. So uh, some of the content we're going to cover today really about some use cases, um, what some of our customers are doing. Um, we're going to talk about some of the challenges with that and the current approaches, um, some of the requirements that have been generated based on some of the new things with Docker, new ways of scaling data centers, new ways of thinking about cloud. Oh, looks like my uh, slides are moving around here a little bit. Uh, and then last but not least, uh, a proposed solution. Uh, we'll talk about some uh, contributions to open source that we're going to be making. So. Um, what is hyperscale? Well, looks like this is going to move quite a bit. I'll just put it down. I'll just put it down. Uh, <laughs> maybe there's a battery I could pull out of this. Oh. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Not much better. Sorry about that. So, uh, what is hyperscale? Right. Um, You've heard this displayed many different ways, Google infrastructure for everyone else, right? Thinking about how do we take the ways that a Google, a Facebook, and Amazon operate a data center and apply that to the rest of the world uh, in a way that makes us more efficient. And the reality is we're, we're a long ways away from that, right? We have much more complex applications, uh, much smaller development engineering teams, and a much uh, different set of application requirements making it you know, a huge gap, right? So, one of the things we're trying to do with our product portfolio is think about you know, how do we build solutions around you know, bringing those benefits in a way that's more consumable, uh, more easy to use, uh, and, and more designed for, for your scale. So if you think about it, uh, one of the first challenges today with, with thinking about hyperscale is that everything is now a data center, right? Whether you scale out to you know, thousands of racks across multiple sites, uh, all the way down to a server itself and even the components within the server. Depending on how you look at it, there could be thousands of components, devices, software, hardware, sending lots of different data in lots of different formats at lots of different rates. And one of the biggest challenges we see is sort of the merger of really three different vectors uh, across this 5G and sort of what we call edge computing. Um, obviously, Ericsson, if you're not familiar with this, we're in the radio business. We've been building networks for a very long time. 5G is, is, is something that we're, we're rolling out now and starting to uh, you know, invest heavily in with our, with our telco operators. But we're seeing that sort of uh, converge with cloud and, and IoT, right? More kinds of devices. And, and what you sort of wind up with is, is this long tail problem around many different device types, many different operating systems, many different software types. And what sort of results is, is you sort of wind up with this massive service area that's vulnerable to attack, uh, this massive service area that's it's difficult to manage, um, and, and it becomes a big data problem. Right? The data is high velocity, high volume, but it's low variety. Right? This is one of the sort of unique things about machines. They're not like people. Um, they're designed by people, but the kinds of data they generate tend to be finite in their nature. It's predictable in some sense. Right? We're going to get classic things like CPU and memory utilization and temperature and power, and they're going to be expressed in a standard way. Maybe different formats, maybe different sample rates and different frequencies. But point being is this is predictable. It's not like people data. And um, one of the things you find is that depending on how you're approaching solving this, you might be using solutions built for people data to collect machine data. And that becomes uh, one of the challenges we see. Then you start thinking about, well, okay, I've got you know, multiple availability sites, multiple colos, multiple data centers worldwide. Maybe I'm thinking about more distributed kinds of applications. Well, you know, how do I deal with things like consensus algorithms that I've run in traditional databases, right? Uh, time, as we know, is relative. Consensus algorithms rely on clocks being in sync. And applying, trying to apply that to a distributed data center is just sort of meaningless because the time will never be in sync, the data will never converge. 
So we need to start thinking about time and distributed systems in a different way when it comes to collecting machine data and perhaps push more of that intelligence out to the edge. Maybe we will never have consensus. Maybe we need the machines the ability have, uh, to have the ability to make decisions themselves right, in real time uh, based on very good data that we know is assured and, and secure. Right? And then when you think about all this, we've got diverse protocols. We've got continuously accelerating technology refresh cycles. It seems every year we've got a new architecture, a new uh, you know, virtualization technology, a new substrate. Um, it's difficult to keep up with that, right? So it becomes a huge problem. What you find is depending on where you're at in this journey to uh, managing your infrastructure, you might find that a lot of the times we simply don't know what we have and what it's doing. Maybe this data has been on spreadsheets. Maybe we have some of it that's monitored, but we definitely don't have a complete picture in most cases. And if you think about that as applied to a data center lifecycle, decision making becomes very difficult, right? If I don't have good data feeding each of these sort of phases of my data center, whether it be from sort of the procurement phase when I'm making decisions about, you know, should I buy this type of hardware? You know, am I capable of investing in something like open compute? Um, you know, how much should I buy, right? We tend to over provision because again, we don't have good data to make good decisions. And, and you sort of walk your way through this life cycle decision making phase and what you find is that there's a lot of different tools, a lot of different sources. Uh, a lot of different ways to approach sort of looking at this, but not necessarily looking at it holistically and really looking at it from a lifecycle management perspective because we're all in the supply chain business, right? If you think about a data center, um, it, it's a supply chain, right? It starts, you know, whether you're ordering a virtual machine or a physical machine, it starts with your requirements and, and everything that you need to procure and order and manage through its sort of life cycle and then retire it, you know, as technology advances. So we want to start thinking about these things holistically and, and drive towards a more standard approach uh, and a more logical approach to, to managing data in a data center. So what you find is that um, you know, the current approaches we applying, we're applying are working, right? Um, depending on sort of how sophisticated an organization might be, you might have a DevOps team that's integrating some of these common open source uh, frameworks. You know, things like Solar, Elasticsearch, uh, you know, for searching, parsing through logs. Some people are putting time series data in there, but they find it struggles to scale. Um, using things like Spark for real-time data processing and MapReduce for, for batch processing, right? Um, and then a wide variety of different database solutions depending on the type of data we're dealing with, right? Is it you know, uh, structured in nature? Is it unstructured? Is it uh, atomic in nature? Is it time series? And what you find is we, we wind up with a very complex infrastructure. And what we find is that most customers that we, we're, we're working with tend to really get stuck on this, right? Because at the end of the day, this is a very, very complex thing to manage, right? Um, you need a very large team of people to sort of integrate all this. And then when any of these sort of components change or break or, or sort of get updated for different use cases, you're sort of, you know, chasing uh, the, the, the sort of update, so to speak. And what you find is that a lot of these technologies weren't really built thinking about machines. They were built thinking about people and user data and, and sort of a different way of consuming information and generating information. So what we want to think about is how do we provide a simple solution that's really designed just for the data center, just for machines, and just for sort of the unique challenges that we thought about. And that sort of came back to a, a set of basic requirements, right? Small footprint. One of the biggest challenges in a data center is depending on sort of your network, the host that you're running, the type of compute that we're running, right? We're talking about doing things with disaggregation and having pools of compute resources spread across racks and data centers. So we need to start thinking about a footprint that's sort of a lowest common denominator, right? It should be able to run anywhere uh, with a very simple set of instructions and give me some basic information, right? And if I want to extend that to offer additional functionality, it should be very easy to do in an open source manner. It should be highly scalable. There should be some generic aspects to the data model. One of the bigger problems with sort of traditional database approaches to this is there's sort of an assumed structure to each way you input data into each of these solutions, right? There's a database schema you have to deal with. There's sort of import-export concerns, right? Everybody talks about the S3, you know, gravitational effect of data, right? Once data is somewhere, it becomes very hard to port it. And if you have not only the weight of the data, but the format of the data fighting you, it becomes much more difficult to deal with things like vendor lock-in. And, and these are some of the things that we thought about as we approach some of the solutions that we're building. So what does the solution look like? Well, it needs to be open source. Um, I think that's been well identified within this community, right? Open compute is working, right? Um, people are buying it. You can, you can go to the store and buy open compute and get it in a few months' time, right? Um, so we believe in that, and we think anything sort of associated with 
you know, distributed infrastructure, it has to be open source because some of the world's biggest companies, that's a requirement to even begin talking about running this kind of software. Um, we need an architecture that's lightweight and extensible, right? Historically, when it came to agents and ways of collecting data, um, we would have sort of monolithic paradigms for different operating systems, different operating environments, different hardware types, uh, and they would add weight to the system, right? So you sort of hear about this agent fatigue. Well, if I gotta run three agents, um, you know, that's gonna have an impact on my performance. I can't run agents, right? They're, they're, they're bad, agents are bad. You know, and all the usual things, secure and supported. So I'm gonna skip ahead here a little bit and, and really talk about what, what are we bringing to market, right? Um, so Ericsson's had a long storied history of open source contributions, um, the sort of most fabled one being Erlang, which if you're not familiar is a open source programming language designed for you know, messaging and distributed systems. It's what runs WhatsApp, right? Which is um, you know, obviously a, a big part of the world's internet infrastructure. And uh, we've had a long history of sort of making these contributions. So uh, one of the things that we're sort of soft announcing today uh, is we're actually gonna contribute uh, our client software uh, for data collection and configuration of x86 machines. So uh, what does this mean? Well, this is a set of different tools and capabilities and components that we've built uh, to collect data on our infrastructure. Um, we recently uh, launched our entry in the server space, the HTS 8000 uh, rack scale designed infrastructure around um, servers, and uh, this is actually the infrastructure we're using in production to collect data from, from those servers. We actually use the microkernel to boot into these systems to sort of capture a state and inventory of the machine. Um, we're gonna sort of contribute that as like a reference architecture, right? Everybody's got their own microkernel. Uh, the problem is actually not the kernel itself, but the drivers and associated things you need to boot it. Um, but we use it and we said, hey, well, why don't we put this out there? Others can see value out of it. Uh, we've got a standard agent, and then we've got a set of uh, components that exist underneath that, a mini agent, and then a set of collectors. And really think of this as sort of our approach to collecting data in a data center, really think about disaggregation, large scale out infrastructure, and, and distributed systems. So a little bit about uh, our approach, you know, the anatomy of an agent. Um, at its core, sort of three core concepts, uh, collectors, forwarders, and formatters. Um, the way to think about it is, First thing we gotta do is collect data, right? And a collector could be anything. It could be a one-line script, it could be a API call, it could be a shell script, whatever you want. Um, but we've got some standard ones and our approach is sort of use what's there, right? A lot of existing solutions sort of bundle all the software together with an agent that you need to, to do what you need to do. Um, we sort of took the approach that, you know, data center in a 5G distributed world is sort of the wild, wild west. We don't know really what we're gonna find but we can make some basic assumptions about the operating system and underlying interfaces. So let's use what's there. Let's use common existing tools. Let's not have any external dependencies so that way when you deploy it, if it can do nothing else but get a host name and IP address, hey, at least it works and it's communicating, then we can start to learn from the environment and pull more data back. Formatters uh, do things like change format, right? Um, one of the other big problems is different formats of JSON, different formats of time series, different formats of you know, configuration data. Um, we wanna be able to format that into sort of any way we see fit. Um, we have some default ones we're gonna uh, include here so you can sort of natively um, send data to things like Elasticsearch, you know, sort of graphite format, Grafana format data. Um, you know, be able to stream directly into something like Spark, um, send the data as files to any source. Um, and then last but not least, what's sort of the protocol or the format, right? Um, a lot of people doing things with message buses. We wanna be able to talk sockets, right, where that makes sense. Um, we wanna talk UDP where that makes sense, right, where we're sort of in these lossy networks, um, you know, where maybe we don't necessarily have guaranteed transmission of information, right? Um, so these are all things that we're thinking about, and then sort of what we've done is added sort of our own security audit and performance enhancements around this and sort of created a prepackaged binary of this that we run today in our production software. And again, this should be able to run in any standard Linux environment. And um, you know, the hope is that you'll be able to go in here and sort of um, add collectors as you see fit, um, you know, create formatters and forwarders, and these should be things that, that take a day. You know, a standard DevOps engineer should be able to spend a day, write a little line of code and be able to get the data that they need in the format that they want. Um, so I talked about some of, the, some of the requirements. Some of the other things to think about in distributed systems is really about um, failing hard and restarting fast. Um, everybody talks about uptime, but one of the biggest things is tolerating failures because um, when something is breaking, we want it to fail. We want it to generate as many logs as it can 
and crap out as fast as it can because that's valuable information. We can actually use that to maybe prevent that failure and make the system more robust. But in that scenario, it should be able to restart fast, instantly restart. It shouldn't take time to boot up, pull packages. It should just come right back up. And what does that mean for you? Well, you, you, you get the information you need, and perhaps you never even lose any data, right? Because we're talking about a sample rate, right? If that system fails and it restarts fast, it might come back up before we've even collected data again five seconds later. Um, so these are some of the concepts about how we're thinking about it. And then, you know, last but not least, self-configuring and self-updating. Um, one of the sort of bigger problems you think about managing any scale environment is I have 10,000 of these things, how do I update it, right? I have 10,000 of these things and there's a problem. You know, how do I sort of deal with that? Um, so we sort of want these systems to start to become more intelligent, um, leverage some of the built-in encryption capabilities and the hardware, things like Intel TPM, to where we have sort of a you know, known quantity of who we're communicating with and where that data is coming from. So that we can actually start to do these things where when an agent comes up, it doesn't necessarily have to know anything except its discovery protocol to go out and get its config, pull it down, and, and get to work. A um, little bit about the architecture and some of the things that we're doing. Um, you know, part of our sort of back-end systems, we've actually built sort of a data store to sort of collect all this data uh, and, and actually um, file format. Uh, one of the, the other big advantages we have now is that um, disk is really, really fast. Um, I.O. is really fast, CPU is fast. So I can actually collect lots of machine data and just simply store it on disk and, and actually have it be extremely performant and also take advantage of some of the disk uh, level tools and file system tools. But effectively what we're talking about here is a way to think about c collecting data, right? Um, sort of in-band on the host within the host operating system and then out of band on the network. And then these are some of the protocols that we're talking, things that we're thinking about. Um, we also have some abilities to actually do uh, configuration of things. Um, one of the things we use our microkernel for is to boot up uh, via Pixie, discover some things about the hardware, and based on that, actually apply policy to what actually boots. So we actually want to configure boot orders. Uh, we want to create RAID sets. We want to update firmware and sort of have an entire sort of stack of requirements to, to boot a particular machine. And we sort of have the basic primitives to do that. And again. What we want to do is create sort of a framework to provide all this functionality at scale, but we want to give you the nice, easy, simple means for you or your partners or, or your uh, vendors to work on, you know, what is the last little bit of code I need to work with this particular device or this particular application. And then this will sort of give you the sort of transition path for a day when we can maybe hopefully get most of this data out of band with things like Redfish, right? Um, Redfish and what Intel's doing with PSME and the sort of pool standard uh, management um, engine which is sort of an evolution of IPMI, the hope is that eventually we can get everything we need out of band, you know, via some of these interfaces so that maybe we don't have to run agents, right? And that's sort of where we're trying to go with this. So how does this all fit sort of into the bigger picture, right? I talked a lot about sort of collecting data at the edge and the types of things that we're doing. Um, you know, one of the things that we think about is sort of what is the full stack, right? This agent, maybe today it's x86, but there's a lot of different kinds of things that run in x86. There's switches, there's storage, there's uh, different types of sort of hardened applications, right? Um, there's mobile devices, right? There's different kinds of things that are quote unquote data centers now that I want to collect data from. So, you know, our hope is that we can sort of take this framework and sort of expand literally on our GitHub page a set of collectors to go after all these different sources of data in a seamless fashion. Uh, maybe our customers will build some and they'll contribute it and we'll make them available. Uh, and then have that data in a known good framework so we can go do the really cool stuff, right? Apply advanced machine learning techniques, right? Everybody talks about the ability to sort of make a data center that can power itself up and down and deploy capacity on demand based on needs. Well, we're not gonna do that until we have good data, right? It's, it's a garbage in, garbage out problem. And if we don't have good data, we're never gonna make good analytics to be able to go do the really cool advanced things that we wanna do. So our hope uh, is that bringing this data in in a consistent format and in a consistent way we can then go do some of this really cool stuff, maybe even start to do modeling and simulation of data centers, right? Um, you know, that's one of sort of the big promises of big data. You know, if we know enough about sort of the modeling of a system, maybe we can scale that out. And, you know, imagine if a developer can run on their laptop a, you know, 10,000 node sort of data center, at least in terms of how it responds to a particular vector. You know, what are the things we might be able to do? And then really our hope is that once we sort of have this entire picture laid out and we have good visibility, we can sort of then model what GE would call like a digital twin of a data center, right? Where it's an entire JSON, you know, topology of all the components and systems to where it can then start to then measure it, make changes in the virtual world, and then apply it back to the physical, right? 
this whole idea of an entirely immutable data center, right? Where a data center is something that I check in as simple as code from GitHub, right? I check it out, I make changes to my local environment, and I push it to production. So this is some of the stuff we're trying to do, and again, it all starts with having good data collection. And um, I'll, uh, I'll leave it with, um, you know, sort of a, a food for thought. Um, you know, Ericsson entered the space about two years ago uh, with the announcement of our entry into the, the server space. And, um, you know, one of the reasons we're open sourcing this agent is because it's actually being run by a lot of the world's biggest operators. Um, we, we've had a, a, a tremendous amount of success with the HDS 8000 product, which, as I mentioned, is sort of the standard uh, platform upon which we collect data. And, um, you know, these are some of the end users that are, that are consuming the software. So um, watch Ericsson's GitHub page in the coming weeks and months. Um, we're going to have documentation there shortly. Um, we are looking for uh, early adopters, people that want to sort of test drive it, give us feedback, and maybe even look at contributing. Already seen some interest from a few software OEMs. So if there's interest in that, um, reach out to me. I'm responsible for these products and uh, happy to chat uh, now after the show or uh, follow up later. And with that, I've uh, got a few more minutes, maybe, maybe a couple of questions. Is it just the uh, agent that's being outsourced or open sourced today, or is there another piece, a collector piece? So well? it's all uh, all four of these components. So the way to think about it uh, is the agent is really uh, a superset of the mini agent and the collectors. They're just different deployment models, right? The agent's designed to be sort of a, we're literally going to have a binary. You'll be able to download it and, and run it and not even mess with compiling or anything. Um, everything's written in Golang. That was the language we chose. It's what Google uses in their data center. The mini agent is sort of designed for more of a developer flow. If you want to sort of integrate an existing application, that'll be a part of this. The standard collectors we offer, which are basically OS and down, will be a part of this. And then the microkernel is basically uh, this mini agent wrapped into a um, CentOS image that you can then boot up uh, statelessly using Pixie, and there'll be some files associated with it. So that's, that's the, the content of the release. Any other uh, questions? Oh, one more here. Nope. So this agent, will, where will it actually reside? Will it be in the management section of the rack server, or uh, is it going to be in the MEC? Or it, it could run anywhere you like. So if you're thinking in the context of, of HDS specifically, um, it runs within the server itself. Um, and you could run this in a switch if you want. It can collect data there. There's, there's a lot of different layers upon which you can leverage it. But we're specifically in the HDS using it for managing our own systems as well as third-party systems. So this will run on Dell, HP, Open Compute Systems, and, and we'll bring them all into our management framework. All right, any more questions? All right. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate, Appreciate it. it.